Transformation, Transformation Seminar. We're really fortunate to have Pro Professor Vishwas Satka with us today. A few of us in the room have already been totally animated by his energy and, and his work on, on a whole range of issues that he will talk to today. He is a professor in the Department of Industrial Relations. Uh, there's a difference. Inter it says international relations. <laughs> okay, at WITS, and a principal investigator of the research project, a Mellon Foundation funded project called Emancipatory Future Studies in the Anthropocene, an activist of over three decades, co founded and now chairs the Board of Cooperative and Policy. Alternative Center, COPAC, editor of Democratic Marxism book series. And then when you get to the recent publications, the edited uh, books, I'll, I'll just list them and you'll see that you, you can't have been sleeping for the past five years. <laughs> so 2019, Racism After Apartheid, Challenges for Marxism and Anti-Racism, um, Uni Wits University Press, 2019, Cooperatives, in South Africa, Advancing Solidarity Economy Pathways from Below, 2019, UKZN Press, Climate Crisis, South African and Global Democratic Eco-Socialist Alternatives, 2018, that's University Press, Capitalism's Crisis, Class Struggles in South Africa and the World, 2015, and with uh, Roger Southall, Casato in Crisis, The Fragmentation of an African Trade Union Federation, 2015. So you've been busy. <laughs> and also, when it comes to the activist networks that um, you briefly mentioned in our, in our meeting now, it's quite extraordinary. So, and, and very inspiring because climate change, climate crisis can be a bit overwhelming and there's you know, this end times, catastrophic imagination, but actually when you see what people are doing and connecting it to a whole range of other aspects of people's lives, food sovereignty and issues around trade unions and so forth, one begins to see that the politics has already landed and it's, the networks are there, they're just not that visible and Professor Satka was mentioning they've been having to have meetings with uh, the media to try and remind the media that this is happening because we don't see it. I, I don't see it. I, I just uh, am struck by the fact the, the Guardian educates me on this. I have to go to the Guardian to actually find out what's going on. And we seem to be caught up in the immediacy of other crises that don't allow us to, to look at, at these key aspects. So thank you very much. And could you please announce the other events that you'll be involved in during your, your visit? Thank you. Okay, well, uh, good, good afternoon to everybody, and uh, thank you for hosting me and bringing me down. Um, I'm going to situate a climate justice lens and perspective around the climate crisis. Um, now this is a language that is common to transnational activism. It's a language that's finding its place increasingly in South Africa and was actually pioneered here in many ways, coming out of environmental justice activism. But uh, in doing this, I'm going to speak to some of the official discourses first around climate that are coming out of the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. Uh, and disrupt two notions, I mean, particularly this, this idea of population as a problem, and speak a bit critically to the notion of the Anthropocene. Um, and then I kind of want to transition into talking about systemic alternatives, and then finally ground this conversation in what we need to be doing together. Uh, I'm an activist scholar, I'm a social scientist, I'm not a physicist, I'm not a climatologist, and I'm going to kind of come into this from that perspective. So if you look at um, climate change discourse, particularly in the US context, it's been muddied by denialism, or most importantly, by a doubt machine. And this doubt machine has been created by the fossil fuel industry, like the Koch brothers. And what they've done is they've constructed a discourse in the US over 
20 year period or longer of false equivalence. So you have a consensus, a 97% consensus in the world amongst the top climate scientists in the world that have been basically at the sort of backbone of the UN IPCC climate science saying this is what's happening. Okay, so the cutting edge science is telling us planet Earth is heating, all right? And the denialists have been saying, well, we are the 3% and we disagree, okay? And they've kept that doubt machine going in the United States, and as a result, you have a carbon criminal in the White House today, okay? That is firmly supported by carbon interests. But that discourse also finds its expression even in South Africa, all right? So, you know, climate denialism, why do we have to address this problem? Okay, it's part of the natural cycles of the Earth's history and things like that. But the more we think of the science, and it's very, very important to keep the science front and center in our conversation, it helps us appreciate that we are in an unprecedented, no analog shift going on in the history of planet Earth. And uh, there are particular causal factors at work. So yes, we are heating. And the science is showing us very clearly that we are heating in dramatic ways. And the climate scientists uh, and the physicists and so on that are working on this mark it as 1950. So yes, 150 years of industrialization and the Industrial Revolution. But 1950 is a key marker in this discourse. It's Michael Mann's hockey curve. It's when we see the great acceleration. And various structural dynamics feed into this, okay? So whether it's um, uh, industrial agriculture being scaled up after World War II, whether it's a new wave of industrialization, particularly in the peripheries of capitalism, et cetera, this great acceleration um, is happening. And carbon emissions are basically going up on a planetary scale. And so, in the IPCC discourse, if you read some of these reports, and I've looked at them as well, you basically get a feel and a sense and a, and a conception that it's all about population. Population is the problem. So yes, we're going to be hitting 7.7 .7 billion. Uh, and you know, if you look at how fast it's happened, a lot of it's happened in the 20th century. And probably we're going to hit 9.7 billion in a couple of decades' time. Now, this is not to say that population doesn't have impacts on ecological relations. But there's two things we've got to keep in mind and that we've got to unsettle in this discourse. The first is that if you really look at resource footprints, so the average American, if we reproduce their way of life on planet Earth, we're going to need five planet Earths. The average European their resource-intensive way of life, if we reproduce it on planet Earth, will need two and a half Earths, okay? Compared to the average African, okay? The average, if we all live like the average African, we'll be living within the boundary of planet Earth, putting it simply, okay? So that's the first thing to keep in mind, that there are resource inequalities. The second thing about this, if you reduce the problem to population, you end up in a neo-Malthusian place, and you become racist, actually. So it's the fertility rates in Africa that are the problem. It's the darker nations, okay? It's India, it's Africa, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a need for a nuance, and there's a need for us to think through this population problem. But it features in the official discourses around climate change. And I think it's very, very misleading. And from a climate justice perspective, it's something that we've got to think about critically. So yes, we are in the state that last registered three million years ago, and basically uh, three million years ago, it was an unlivable world, all right? So we, we are experiencing right now uh, this one degree Celsius increase since pre the Industrial Revolution uh, that actually is um, in historical time a catastrophic experience for all planet Earth. So the official climate <coughs> change narrative uh, helps us understand that we have had natural cycles of cooling and heating, but it also helps us recognize that there is another element, that human beings are this geological force shaping planetary conditions. Now, this wasn't there before. And so human beings are impacting on the parameters of planet Earth, on its livability, and so on. 
And of course, in this narrative, at the heart of this narrative, is population growth. And I'm saying that that has to be unsettled. The other point about this narrative is that it helps us understand, from a scientific point of view, the rise of carbon emissions. Okay? And you can see it. And the point about this from a climate justice perspective is that it prompts us to think in terms of climate debt and who is responsible for this. So common but differentiated responsibility is a very important principle, but actually over uh, two decades of negotiations uh, in a multilateral process, that principle has been reduced actually to nothing. Okay, We are actually at a point in world history where, well, particularly with US influence and the influence of carbon corporations, well, we all are responsible for this problem, okay? So this is the second narrative that I want to transition into, and the way it was explained to me recently, and I was in Europe for three months talking to climate scientists, etc., because I'm not a climate scientist, so I went to understand a bit more about this. So they say, basically, we've had three planet Earths, if you like. The first planet Earth was before 11,000 years, and that's when we had these wild fluctuations and changes and so on in planetary temperatures, etc. 11,000 years ago, the second planet Earth began, and that's when we had uh, what was called the age of the Holocene, and we had a relatively stable climate for 11,000 years. And in that time, human, human civilization thrived. Uh, we, we basically had the Neolithic Revolution and agriculture, and we had writing and mathematics and philosophy, and all the great things about humanity flourished in this 11,000 year period. But we are now entering the third planet Earth, okay? And the third planet Earth is about this, and this is about climate change, and with us as a factor in this process. So if you look at this, this comes out of the Stern Review. The building blocks of society and the building blocks of civilization are really in jeopardy as temperatures go up. So if you just look at food. So we are now at a one degree Celsius increase in planetary temperature since pre the Industrial Revolution. And we are already seeing severe stresses and strains on our food system. And as it goes up, I mean, really, food systems crash. Now, the South African uh, industrial food system crashed now during this drought <coughs> we've had in South Africa. So we had to import a couple of million tons of maize. Our cattle had to be slaughtered and livestock had to be slaughtered, etc., etc. The Sahel region right now, five million people are food stressed. In Zimbabwe, complex problem, uh, but two million people are food stressed right now as we speak. Okay, 76% of peasants in Mozambique are poor. Uh, in terms of a particular metric, but with the inundation of water, etc., the planting season has been compromised. So what's going to happen? Okay. So it's not just not, it's not just droughts. It's a whole set of extreme shocks that will bring down food systems. Okay. As planetary temperatures increase, so the building blocks get compromised. Water is the big issue as well. The the science tells us that a human being cannot survive without water for basically three days. Okay, so think about this. Day zero, da da da. Okay, it's a lived experience of most people in this country. At least 54% of people in South Africa do not have access to a tap for clean drinking water in their household. That's water inequality in South Africa. And that cannot be sustainable. So, extreme weather shocks are registering right now with this one degree increase. Okay. The media in South Africa is not telling the story, and this was the earlier discussion I had with Stephen and others, uh, and that's why we protested outside SANAF, and that's why we're building a climate justice awareness uh, project with SANAF in our media, because our media is just talk nonsense. So basically, basically, uh, you know, if you look at Al Jazeera, you look at CNN, you look at the Guardian newspaper, they are mainstreaming what's happening on planet Earth. We need this to be mainstreamed, okay? And of course, Cyclone Idai and so on, uh, this is completely outside of the pattern of uh, cyclone uh, activity and so on. So you have these, these two devastating cyclones hitting one of the poorest countries in the world, okay? It's gonna be impossible to, to 
even think about how recovery is going to happen here. And this is where climate debt is owed. The global south is going to be experiencing an unraveling, if you like. And debt is going to be at the heart of this issue. So what the IMF controls the debt of Mozambique. It was already in a locked into a IMF structural adjustment program before this hit. Okay, there's a billion dollars worth of infrastructure damage there. They've given them a hundred and eight million dollar loan on top of the existing loans. Okay, and so on. But there's also massive gas reserves in Mozambique. Okay, so Sasol is invested in those gas reserves. All right. Now, does Sasol owe a climate debt to Mozambique? Does Sasol owe reparations to Mozambique? These are the questions from a climate justice perspective that we have to talk about. So basically, we are, the three worlds in summary existed before the Holocene, this first sort of crazy uh, world that we couldn't live in it. And then, of course, 11,000 years ago, we had this kind of Eden kind of moment, if you like, and now we are leaving that behind, okay? We are entering a different kind of world, okay? A climate-driven world, a climate breakdown world, uh, a climate crisis world, okay? And basically, the science is telling us that there are crucial tipping points that we have to be looking at that could feed into runaway global warming. So right now, what's happening in Greenland is shocking even the climate scientists, including the ones I spoke to, okay? And so there's a whole slew of research projects to kind of understand what's going on in the Arctic, what's going on in the West Antarctic. The West Antarctic actually is closest to us as South Africa, as an African country, but yet it's not part of our imagination, okay? And it's disappearing very, very fast, okay? One of the biggest icebergs on planet Earth is right here. This has catastrophic implications for sea level rise Etc. Okay, so these are the canaries in the mine. So between one and three degrees Celsius, you watch these yellow things. Already, you can see massive coral bleaching across the world, etc. And as these things kick in, uh, well, we have serious problems. Uh, we're assuming that the Amazon rainforest will get affected between three and five degrees Celsius, but actually, the lunatic in in Brazil who is wanting to industrialize the greenest lung we have on planet Earth. All these wildfires and fires you're seeing around the Amazon and the news and so on, well, he's literally destroying this, okay? And he's destroying indigenous people as well. And that means he's destroying all of us, okay? Bolsonaro, okay? So basically, uh, I mean, the science is very clear that these tipping points are displaying dangerous symptoms, okay? So to summarize, around this issue. So we have the Anthropocene um, as this new geological age, this new climatological marker, if you like, this historical marker, and it's part of the official narrative. And I'm gonna unsettle it a little bit from a climate justice perspective. But it helps us understand that we did have a relatively stable climate, the Holocene, for 11,000 years. And the big challenge now is with climate change, are we hardwiring shifts in planet Earth's climate? Okay? Are we locking in these major changes of runaway global warming? When these tipping points kick in, when methane release and the feedback loops happen from the Arctic, when that similar thing happens in Antarctic, etc., what's going to happen? Okay? So we are not at that point. We haven't hardwired the shifts in planet Earth yet. And this is what the climate scientists told me. So, and I'm clinging to it, okay? <laughs> we haven't reached the point of runaway global warming. Runaway global warming by four, five, six degrees Celsius, we're all dead, okay? It's as simple as that. Take it away, that's the message, we're dead, okay? Human life will be impossible, all right? And so, this is the biggest challenge that we face, okay? And again, I said, keep the science front and center. So, the climate justice response, beyond the physics and the chemistry of what's happening to planet Earth, is how do we explain the shift to an Anthropocene, this, this major geological and historical and climate shift in our story as human beings? Well, climate justice has a political economy basis to it, and it can explain why climate change is happening. 
Okay, so the top 100 carbon polluters have not been held responsible even in the IPCC multilateral negotiations. The multilateral negotiations are premised on the responsibility of nation states. It's not premised on the responsibility of carbon corporations. It's not premised on the role of shipping. Shipping has a massive carbon footprint. It is never featured in the IPCC negotiations. Airlines have a massive carbon footprint. Okay? They do not feature in the IPCC negotiations. So the political economy critique of climate justice is very, very important. South Africa has a first world climate problem. So if you look at ESCOM, it's number 29 on the list of top 100 carbon polluters in the world. You look at SASOP, it's number 45 on the list of top 100 carbon polluters in the world. Okay? And we cannot be talking about this false dichotomy between development and addressing the climate crime. Sorry, there's no time. And there are solutions to address both. And some of these institutions literally have to die. Okay? There's another world. If South Africa is going to meet its net zero emission targets, which is part of the ratchet up mechanism, part of the multilateral commitments that South Africa is meant to be making, and I disagree with the General Secretary of the United Nations that it must be 2050 for countries. No, we are running out of time. The G20 countries constitute four-fifths of the major polluters, if you look at it in, in country terms. Okay? South Africa is part of that G20. We have to do more, and we have to do it seriously. So the IPCC report of October 2018 talks about a window of the next 12 years. So by 2030, we must basically be at 45% um, of 2010 levels, and by 2050, net zero. Okay, So that's the loudest alarm bell that has come out of the United Nations IPCC. All right? We are running out of time, and we have to act now. And so a climate justice perspective would look at the role of carbon capital in our society and how it is effectively ensuring its interests are reproduced. So we've got a Minister of Energy that talks about the game changer of the total gas find of Mossel Bay in the context of this science, in the context of this world that we are going into. Who's mad? Okay, so the deep just transition is another very, very important idea, and it comes from trade unions in this process. And trade unions are very clear that we cannot have the poor and the working class of our societies paying the price of this transition. They are already carrying major inequalities. They are victims of these inequalities. Okay? Uh, and so the deep just transition is really about tackling the root causes of this problem with systemic alternatives, new energy systems. Trade unions talk about socially owned renewable energy in South Africa, a very advanced idea. Food sovereignty, we need a new food system. We need a new transport system. Why can't we have clean energy, public transport, and so on? Uh, I mean, I can go on. We need water systems and water commoning as a public good, et cetera, et cetera. Climate justice also brings a race, gender, and class lens to climate shocks. So in the context of day zero, so 26,000 boreholes get dropped down by the rich in Cape Town. Okay, so what happens to the rest of the people? Okay? Uh, the people in Google Air 2, etc., etc., who've been experiencing day zero, as we know, there's been a water, there is a water issue in this country. So climate inequalities are also injustices that are climate justice politics foregrounds. The other point about climate justice is that it recognizes that we are not the only life form on planet Earth. There are other beautiful creatures that we share this planet with as part of ecosystems. And so in that sense, it's justice for all life forms on planet Earth. We are wiping out, so the International Panel on Biodiversity, it's another important report you should look at, particularly as students. We're wiping out a million species out of eight million. We've impacted 75% of land surface area on planet Earth. You need to be thinking about this issue very, very carefully. The more we heat this planet, um, and more carbon capital heats this planet, we're going to be wiping out a whole lot of other species. The other point about climate justice is that it's about intergenerational justice. It's about present and future generations. So young people like yourselves, if you think about the IPCC report 
In 10 years' time, where are you going to be? Or 12 years' time, where are you going to be? All the certainties of your life is unhinged in a climate-driven world. Okay? So this is a very, very serious issue, and it's about justice for your generation as well. Okay? Uh, and it's a serious thing. It's a very important thing. Okay? And that is why you have to be at the front lines of the struggle that's needed around this issue. We have to build a powerful grassroots movement. And wherever I'm giving this talk, I'm saying this has to be a movement larger than even the anti-apartheid movement that has to be on the streets, etc., etc., led by yourselves, together with us and others who are committed to this issue. So climate justice forces are fighting. And the struggle to defend life actually is a 500-year struggle. And it starts with the Colombian moment of 1492, okay, where indigenous peoples have been defending the web of life for 500 years against the domination of modernity and capitalism. They've had to face genocide, like in this country. People face genocide in this Cape Colony, and so on and so on. We lost a lot of indigenous knowledge, etc., and life, etc. But that struggle has continued as well in a modern context in terms of climate justice. So, in 1994, the Zapatistas rose up to defend in Mexico their biodiversity and their agricultural system from NAFTA. Okay? In uh, Bolivia, indigenous peoples rose up against a Brechtel, a U.S. water corporation that privatized their water and increased the price of water and they kicked it out. It was called the Cochabamba Water Wars. Okay? People have been defending life. In the Niger Delta, women bare-breasted kicked out shell from the Niger Delta. Okay? These have been struggles to defend life. They've been at the forefront of confronting carbon capital. The Standing Rock struggle, did you hear of the Standing Rock struggle? Yes, in the US? A very, very important struggle. Iconic struggle. Indigenous people trying to prevent a pipeline from going through their territory, under their lakes, etc., etc. It mobilized people uh, dramatically. But again, it's not on the, it, these indigenous people are not on the magazine, Economist and Time magazine, etc. They're not in the mainstream newspapers, etc. So they've been at it for a long time. The climate justice movement has been fighting these fights over the past three decades. Uh, they've been on the streets in people's spaces alongside these COP, COP summits, providing a critique of these negotiations articulating alternatives, etc. We are now in a new phase of the struggle, and we are seeing the rise of what I call one degree Celsius forces. <coughs> so circa 2015, we crossed this, average, this, 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 this threshold. Okay. We are seeing Extinction Rebellion uh, in the UK context and its diffusion. We are seeing the Children's for Future movement, all very, very important developments. Okay. But the crucial thing is we must keep the political economy perspective of climate justice front and center. If we lose that perspective, we'll be raising the alarm bell, but that's all we'll be doing. Okay? We will not be talking about systemic change. We will not be talking about climate justice. So Greta Thunberg's an important development in the context of these cycles of resistance. But Greta Thunberg also has to build solidarities with the 3.6 million people, mainly women and children, displaced in Mozambique, 240,000 in Kenya and Somalia, women and children. Similarly in the Sahel right now, the 5 million people food stressed. Okay? So we have to start thinking beyond the crowd politics. We have to start thinking beyond an icon-centered politics. Climate justice is a politics for all of us. The other point to make very quickly is that there is an attempt by those who are, if you like, dominant to present a solution to us around the climate crisis. And we've seen it in the IPCC process, etc. Carbon markets will solve this problem. And I'm sorry, carbon markets are irrational. Okay, They're not going to solve this problem. They haven't worked. So there's this idea of green neoliberalism, and you basically make the climate crisis another outlet for making money. Basically, you're displacing accumulation, okay, and so on. You're shifting it around, and so on. But in a context in which over three decades of a marketized world, an economizing of everything, 
inequalities today are worse than they were in the interwar years. We are seeing the rise of authoritarian and ethno-nationalist forces, the rise of a neo-fascism. So basically, we have an economic crisis that's worsening in the world. But capitalism has had four general crises in its history, late 19th century, which took us into World War I, in the interwar years, which also took us into World War II, in the 1973 period, which also was of world historical significance and led to fundamental changes in power relations in the world order. And we now have the fourth great or total crisis of capitalism. And every crisis has historical specificity to it. And we have to understand each crisis. Okay? We have to understand the dynamics that come together. And it's no longer a conjunctural crisis that's looming and unfolding in front of us. It's a systemic crisis. The entire system is in trouble. And basically, it is interlocking climate crisis, oil peak, food crises, and unstable financialized capitalism, increasing securitization. So we essentially have an unprecedented crisis today in world history. And it's a crisis of the eco-reproduction of society. And that prompts the question, where do we go to? Okay, so there's a transition, actually, towards further catastrophe. There is a transition. It's unfolding. Because the more of the same that we have, this is where we're going. Okay. So we have to recognize that if we continue reproducing the system, we are facing extinction, basically. Okay. If these interlocking crisis tendencies come together, we are facing an ecocidal future, basically. The destruction of conditions that sustain life on planet Earth. And basically, this is the critique of the Anthropocene discourse. The Anthropocene discourse fails to recognize that capital, carbon capital, is really the problem. It fails to recognize that an eco-imperialism, a Trump in the White House, that is accelerating carbon emissions, okay, that has placed the US on the top of the charts in terms of output, higher than Saudi Arabia and Russia today, despite the science, despite the urgency, etc. There is an eco-imperialism that is killing all of us. Okay? And we have to recognize these things. So climate justice is also about decarbonization. And if you really look at the entire world system, economic system, whether it's land use, whether it's uh, transportation, etc., these crucial greenhouse gases are implicated in it. Carbon dioxide comes out of this economic system, methane, nitrous oxide, etc., etc. So, similarly, on a South African scale, every sector of the South African economy has to be, excuse me, fundamentally transformed. And it's not just the energy transition, okay? And that's the point about climate justice. It's the entire economic system that has to change. Water. So in South Africa, 62% of our water resources are controlled by farmers. And for historical reasons, why farmers? Okay. Now we cannot go into a climate-driven world with them controlling these resources. It's, it's, it's crazy. Okay. Uh, so the farmers gave a donation to the city of Cape Town during the, the crisis. Okay. I'm not anti these farmers. I'm just saying these resources are public goods. If you read the Water Act, it says that. And we're going to have to find a way as part of nation building, as part of surviving the climate crisis, to manage these water resources differently. Okay? There will be conflicts. Andri Statane was the first martyr of a water war in South Africa, in Fixburg. Andri Statane was on the streets because his community didn't have water in Fixburg and he was murdered by the police. In the research I'm doing right now, visiting drought-affected communities, etc., there's a similar sentiment amongst people that I've been interviewing. In Makanda, I mean, it's a complex problem, it's institutional failure, it's corruption, but it's also drought, and I've visited all those dams. Nobody's measuring the dam levels, nothing, okay? And people are angry, there's rage there, rage, deep rage. And you don't feel it here in Stella Bosch, it's very nice here. But people are angry there, okay? So the water issue can break societies, 
okay? Very, very seriously. Very seriously. And so we've got to take this thing very, very seriously. The farming issue. The IPCC put out a very important report, the land use report, a few weeks ago. It echoes what many of us have been saying in the food sovereignty campaign uh, on a planetary and in a national context. Industrial scale farming is not the future. It's actually destroying the future. It has a massive carbon footprint, okay? At least 40% of global emissions, okay? I mean, then you start factoring in the farts and the gas and so on that come out of cows, etc. right? 27 billion head of livestock on planet Earth, okay? Now multiply that by a factor of two as populations grow, etc., etc. okay? I mean, really. So there's a, there's, a, there's a serious crisis around a mono-industrial diet that's carbon-based. We have to change. The food we're eating is destroying us and planet and life on planet Earth. Okay? So industrial farming has also destroyed our soils. The FAO even underlines that in the next 60 years, we are not going to have fertile soils because of chemicals and fertilizers, etc. And it's in that context that we really have to start thinking uh, also about uh, alternatives. So, you know, you think that there's an uptake of uh, renewable energy, and yes, in, there is a renewable energy shift happening on planet Earth, okay? But I want to caution you today from a climate justice perspective that it's not just going to be the techno shift that's going to save us. So if you go to the International Energy Agency Global Energy Mix, and I did this, and it's actually very shocking that the energy mix we had 20 years ago is actually very similar to what we have now. Coal is still dominant in the global energy mix, okay? Gas has just been added on a little bit, and that's also a fossil fuel, okay? We are not making that massive shift towards renewable energy. So there's something there that we need to really grapple with, okay? The political economy of renewable energy is such that the costs of production of these technologies has come down dramatically. The cost of installation, etc., has come down dramatically. So there's no money to be made in renewable energy, okay? Unless there is a massive push around renewable energy, and I would call for socially owned renewable energy, like what you had in the German energy shift in the 70s and 80s, communities, villages, and towns controlling wind farms, solar parks, etc., etc. If we have that, the financing question is very important. How are you going to finance this? Green bonds? Are you going to provide subsidies from government, etc., etc.? Are you going to decenter this to local government, etc., etc.? There's a blockage right now around the renewable energy issue on a global scale. South Africa has its own complexities around Eskom, the fox in the hen house, etc., and we can talk a little bit about that. So carbon criminality in South Africa is very, very real. Uh, I have, I've kind of referenced in where we fit in as a carbon criminal state. The energy transition in South Africa, uh, the big progressive idea, as I've been saying, is socially owned renewable energy. And this came from the metal workers in South Africa. They had two big conferences. They did major research on this. And they proposed to the South African government and given the structural crisis of the South African economy and shrinking manufacturing, let's roll out the manufacturing of renewable energy. They did this. There's two conferences. You can go to it, etc. Et the, the data, the research is there. Um, I even wrote a, a journal article on this. But the government turned their back on this. Okay? And so they chose to manage a fossil fuel minerals energy complex. Okay? And we know where that is going. Okay? Our taxpayers' money is constantly going into this massive hole, over 420 billion debt in Eskom. Okay, ANC, Hitachi, Chancellor House tied into their benefiting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's an odious debt question here as well, because the World Bank also gave a loan to Eskom and so on. But the question we got to grapple with: Is it the debt spiral of Eskom and rescuing Eskom, or is it the debt spiral of all of us? This is the debate we have to have, really. There's no future. If South Africa is going to report to the UN negotiations about its commitments okay, to bring down carbon emissions, it's going to have to start talking about when Eskom is going to end. It's going to have to start talking about when Sasol is going to end. It's as simple as that. 
There's no future for these industries if we're going to survive. I mean, you know, it's, it's not complex. It's pretty straightforward. They're going to have to die, basically, if we are to survive. Okay? Simple. And, of course, there's complexity, etc. But there's also alternatives. And alternatives that have come from the global south. Systemic alternatives. The rights of nature discourse from indigenous people's movement. Ecuador has one of the greenest constitutions in the world coming out of struggles by indigenous peoples. And there's a chapter in this book by somebody who convened the constituent assembly in Ecuador around this issue. Uh, there's the whole issue of the basic income grant. The basic income grant can be used to help workers stranded in coal to make that transition. Okay? And all of us, because the, the full employment, and if you look at the ILO data, that era is over, basically. We are never going to have full employment again. There's a complex set of factors in labor markets today, from digitization to global value chains, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have to start thinking differently about socio-ecological reproduction. And the basic income grant is a very crucial idea. Uh, the other idea in all of this, of course, is food sovereignty. Um, I want to. I, I want to. I don't know how I'm doing on time because I, I kind of want to wrap up. And so, yeah. yeah? Five. Five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let, okay. Maybe I won't show you this. Maybe I'll show it to you at the end. Let me just make this point very quickly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go back there just now. So, uh, we are building a climate justice movement in South Africa, and it's been around. An environmental justice movement has been around for 30 years in this country, and it has fought major battles um, uh, in the context of ensuring that human beings and people are also taken seriously as part of how we deal with environmental issues. So this is not conservative conservation politics. But in the context of the climate crisis, um, various forces are emerging and are wanting to take a stand, not just because there's a call for international action from September 20th. The idea is to build an alliance, a red-green alliance in South Africa. So I'm involved with the process that is, 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 is about engaging constituencies in South Africa. We've engaged children, we've engaged drought-affected communities, we've just engaged trade union leaders this week uh, from all the federations, etc. And there's a consensus that we have to take a stand. And so on September 20th, we are targeting SASOL at a national level, but we are, and we're building a human chain around SASOL with all these uh, constituencies. We are, we are also saying there should be decentered action. Uh, we are saying that you should target the other top 100 polluters, or on the list of top 100 polluters, so BP, Shell, etc. They do have petrol stations around here, right? These are carbon polluters. They're on the top 100 in the world. We are calling for local protest actions for climate justice to secure our future. So I'm hoping you as young people, uh, predominantly, We'll go out there, we'll go out there, we'll go out there and take a stand. So this is the climate justice charter process we are busy with. It comes out of five years of activism. And we are, we are really bringing together uh, grassroots voices to shape another way for the country. Uh, this will culminate in a conference in November where we will draft, uh, put together the final draft of the charter. Um, and actually, actually it will be a first draft that will travel. Uh, and we are hoping that you'll also participate in this process um, at, at Stellenbosch and have conversations and tell us what you think should go into this charter. What should a just transition entail? What is required? What is the role of the state? What is systemic alternatives, etc.? So basically, um, I've come here with a message to you. And we've started this at WITS, and we started a few years ago Part of our climate justice strategy is to, is to shift big institutions, to provide symbolic leadership to society. So yes, we can get all afraid and, and feel catastrophic and helpless and so on, but it doesn't have to be like that. If we shift the 25-odd universities in South Africa towards being zero waste, zero carbon, zero hunger, we will be providing powerful examples to society. We weigh down this road with Wits University. We, we gave them a petition with 8,000 signatures. We marched in 2016, and we're moving down this road with our university. Our vice chancellor is also open to the idea of WITS divesting both its minimal reserves compared to Stellenbosch's reserves, 
as well as our pension funds, etc., out of fossil fuels. Okay? So these are the kinds of things you need to be thinking about here as well. Uh, we'd like to invite you to be part of the Climate Justice Charter process. And uh, I got UP here, sorry man, I spoke at the University of Pretoria. But if you can organize an assembly here at Stellenbosch to, to, to bring together, to aggregate ideas and perspectives, we welcome that, okay? And I said we'll be mobilizing on September 20th, but you can do local stuff and we need to hear from you as well. And I'm hoping you'll also consider setting up a climate justice and food sovereignty forum here as well, okay? So if any of you are interested to connecting with the students at WITS, the students at the University of Pretoria, I'm speaking at UCT tomorrow, etc., etc., we can connect all these dots. As I said, you have to be at the center of what's going on. But this is my parting shot to you, and this is, this is coming from... There's been a long drought. The food crisis is deepening. Why? Is this just unpredictable Mother Nature's doing? Or are there other forces at play? The hidden story behind hunger, why we need food sovereignty and climate justice. In South Africa today, a fatal crisis is plaguing the land. Millions are suffering from it. Not only is it making survival difficult, it is ruining lives, destroying families, fragmenting communities, and crippling local economies. We're not talking about HIV AIDS, or TB, or diabetes, or hypertension. We're talking about hunger. Hunger and its close relation, malnutrition. In a country that is abundant in resources, with great mineral wealth, modern cities, and fantastic tourism potential, over 50% of the nation's men, women, and children are food insecure. Who or what is to blame? Some blame it on the drought, some blame it on the El Nino climate cycle, some blame it on climate change. Some blame it on the government, some blame it on corruption, and some blame it on apartheid. These factors are all to blame, to be sure, but there's an elephant in the room. The truth is, we have been forced into an unsustainable, globalized, and coal-driven economic system that cannot feed and sustain the nation. The guardians of this corrupted system, a coal-driven minerals energy complex, and a rapacious cluster of globalized food corporations supported by the state contribute directly to this country's climate, energy, and food crises. But South Africa is not alone in its food crisis. Globally, the loss of land, biodiversity, oceans, and forests is hitting the poor hard. How did this happen? Let's go back 200 years or so to the Industrial Revolution in Britain and Europe. Powered by new coal-fired technologies fueling their furnaces and factories, the capitalist economies of the global north spread their tentacles across the world. By the 20th century, seven Western oil corporations controlled the global oil supply. Today, despite global warming, these corporations are still extracting oil through fracking, tar sands, deep sea drilling, and a new scramble for Africa's oil. And here we are today, about 200 years later, in the post-colonial, post-apartheid, post-fordist industrial age, bang in the middle of a planetary crisis. Capitalism is a key cause of deforestation, carbon emissions, and global warming, as corporations continue to pursue growth and profit above all else. For the last 20 or more years, the annual COP meetings of the UN have affirmed the interests of rich countries and corporations market solutions, techno fixes, and voluntary commitments are not addressing the climate challenge. We need a new paradigm for a transformative, just transition. Let's think again about the web of life. Let's appreciate the interdependence we have with nature and build grassroots power for system change. Pioneered by La Via Campesina, the international small-scale farmer movement, food sovereignty is now an international campaign. Strengthened by international solidarity, the food sovereignty movement has the potential to challenge profit-driven food corporations and democratize the global food economy so we can adapt our food systems to climate change. Under the banner of SAFSI, an alliance of farmer groups, unions, organizations, and communities, we are fighting for a food sovereignty pathway and system. COPAC, like many others, 
supports the South Sea and the solidarity economy. Together we can build a red-green alliance for a just transition now to sustain life. think about. So let's open up. We can take um, three to four comments or questions at a time. And yeah, if you've got more than enough time. And could everybody please uh, int briefly introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks so much. My name is Shaheen. I'm a colleague at the Uh Yeah, I thought it was very fascinating. And um, I particularly like your, because we've been hearing a lot about this lately, um, but specifically the political economy, right? So you're bringing this in and you are saying that, you know, this kind of discussion, the global discussion, is ignoring it, and you're drawing on the indigenous, and you obviously from South Africa, so you're not oblivious to the history, right? Or don't want to be oblivious, at least, let's say. But the problem is then when the movie comes up, hmm. I'm very sensitive to this problem. Right? I'm not a denialist, but I do have a problem with single issue activism, mm -hmm. right? and particularly the way in which the issues shift. Right, so your appeal to political economy specifically highlighted that to the problem of the situation. Right, the debt, the reason why 50 percent of South Africans are food insecure, is not only because of the climate, yeah. right? and it's not only because. But it's also got to do with the state of the history of apartheid and colonialism. Right? So it's a question of unequal development. So I guess I have two problems. Mm. Two questions. The one is like the, 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 the video seems to do the displacement which you are trying to avoid. Right? It seems to relativize all other perspectives. So it, some people say it's apartheid, some people say it's capitalism, but actually it's climate change. Mm. So that's exactly that kind of displacement. Right? So that means, in a way, that you are actually still promoting it, which I feel. Anyway, maybe you can respond to that and think about it. Because clearly it's inequality. I totally agree with you. And if I can buy my water, then I don't care and everybody else can die. And so maybe people in the first world don't give a shit. They still air conditions are pumping like crazy. Right? And it's just to mean people from one of these places. It's just to mean someone and see how they live. They don't have an awareness. Now we don't have the resources. So we automatically know, oh, we need to put the aircon off. Oh, we have to put the heating off. So I think, and I'm just talking anecdotally. So there's something mm. about equality and access and things that's really matter. Uh, yeah, that's actually more. It's more about how to, you know. Okay. I forgot, I forgot the second one, if I remember. <laughs> Do you want to take a, yeah, I'll take a couple. Yeah. another two or so? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And please introduce yourself. Um, my name is Simon Becker, and I'm afraid I'm not one of the younger people in front of you. I'm one of the older ones. Mm. Oh. Um, let me try and ask, ask a, a question which is, which is um, aimed at a, a kind of what is to be done in the medium term. Mm. About a year ago, I read uh, book reviews of Stephen Pinker's Enlightenment Now, and these book, book reviews said, here is someone who's saying that things have been getting better for almost everyone in all countries over the last 300 years. So I decided to read the book. Mm. And I read the book, and I mean, to an extent, the, 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 the graphs he shows are true, but um, he is overly optimistic. Mm. I then read what two issues he said are the real challenges facing us. This is Stephen Pinker. One of them is the climate crisis. Mm. And what he says about the climate crisis is the following, and this is, I suppose, my first question. He says it is simply not possible to imagine in the medium term that renewables are going to be able to make enough energy available to all of us, particularly the, the underclasses, the unprivileged, the disprivileged. So we need to move away from a carbon energy um, system and accordingly what we need to move into is nuclear. So he makes very clearly the point that in the medium term, we need to move into nuclear. I then, knowing a little bit about France, there's this argument being made in France, and there's argument being made by 
a number of, I don't know whether they're the, they're the climate justice people, but certainly the academics and the, the, the energy experts are saying there is meaning to that. We should try and move into a renewable form of energy, but it's going to take a long time. It's going to develop more in your, your capitalist countries than your other countries. It's going to be exported. It's going to be part of the whole system that needs to change. So we need to go the route of nuclear, particularly because it doesn't create you know, gases, carbon, and so on. It does to an extent, but much less. I suppose that's my question. I mean, where would you and where would your, your, your colleagues come mm with regard to the question of, given that we cannot use, we cannot expect a, re a, re a renewable source of energy to be um, broadcast in the near future, we need to move from carbon to nuclear. Okay. Okay, one more comment or question. Thank you for that. Okay, this is great. So the issue of single issue activism, I mean, I, I don't know what kind of work you've done on climate change, um, but one of the things we recognized was that we cannot walk around South African society talking about science and climate. So when we initiated the, the food sovereignty campaign in 2014 after a dialogue across all nine provinces in this country with agrarian sector organizations, food justice activists, etc., we, we realized that the consensus we built that the food system is broken and it's not serving you know, 14 million people who go to bed hungry before the drought, 54% uh, of the people food insecure, etc. We also realized that we're going to have to work with the food issue that connects to the larger issues. Okay, So hunger and the increasing costs of the basic basket of goods, etc., was our entry point into a larger issue. Okay, And, and that's what we did since 2014. Uh, so when we had the Hunger Tribunal with the Human Rights Commission, it was laying bare the complexity of a whole set of things. Uh, you know, a country that is in the sort of wrench of inequality, racialized inequality, a country with structural unemployment, a country now in a drought that is a climate shock, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of these things were coming out when we've had drought speak out, starting in Amalashleni, uh, which is an unlivable place. Okay. In the, in the community hall in Imalashleni, and all the testimony that was coming out there was, if you like, bringing all these issues to the fore. So what, what, what we've done with food sovereignty, and, and you know, if you, if, you, if you really think carefully with the animation, it's not saying climate versus, it's actually saying it's all these factors, but also this. Uh, and it looks at the political economy of carbon as it relates to a food system. So, Essentially, the work we've been doing around food sovereignty has been to try and link these things, basically, because it is a complex problem. So it's not a single issue approach at all. 
Um, and I think it's been, for me personally, and I would argue other activists will say the same thing, it's really helped us make the breakthrough we've made now towards a climate justice charter for the country. And, and where we recognize that um, it's not just a single issue. I mean, climate justice is all of these things, okay? It's, a, it's, it's the totality of the problem. And the conversations we are having in this process, you know, span all the kind of systemic change that has to happen uh, for South Africa to make a socio-ecological transformation. So it's, it's been a very, very powerful entry point. Um, and that's how we, we've engaged around the activism. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's really, it's, it's keeping political economy front and center at the level of practice. Um, it's really trying to, to point out that the carbon-based food system in South Africa, which according to some data says 9% of carbon emissions come from it, I think it's an undercount, uh, while saying here's an alternative. And we can shift communities, villages, towns, and cities to another food system as part of a larger transition. And I think that's the kind of discourse uh, we're trying to develop, including in the Climate Justice Charter roundtables, um, where people are coming at it from different perspectives and, and the whole is coming together more and more. I mean, the, the issue around uh, nuclear, so, well, I mean, I, I, I disagree that renewable energy cannot meet our energy needs. There's been several studies done on this, um, and um, you know whether it's uh, Friends of the Earth, whether it's Oxfam, various organizations have done studies around powering the planet through renewable energy. And uh, the, basically, the renewable energy is in the grip of a complex transition right now, and I've alluded to some of that. The costs have really come down, uh, both for installation as well. Um, the debate we have to have, and it relates to the issue of ESCOM, do you need to either municipalize renewable energy, so it's in the public domain, and roll it out that way, so local governments are ahead of the curve, they're providing regulation, incentive, and so on and so on, and you can start making this transition in local spaces, or do you have to house renewable energy in an ESCOM, okay? and make ESCOM the vehicle, the institutional vehicle, to lead this process in South Africa. This is in the debate right now, actually. Um, I'll come back to that. But, but just to finish around, around nuclear. So nuclear, France has the largest number of nuclear reactors in the world, powers itself through that. Um, I think there's a whole set of issues there that we must unpack. Um, it's, it's clear that um, nuclear reactors and nuclear technologies do have a carbon footprint. It's called EROI, the Energy Return on Investment, and I'd like to see numbers on this, actually, uh, to actually understand its carbon footprint. Uh, it does have a carbon footprint. That's my point. So, you know, you extract uranium, maybe in the African context. So, like, France um, has a strategic location in Mali, why? Because a neighboring country has massive uranium that is making its way to France for its, its energy use. I mean, we're going we're gonna to have to track the political economy of this and its implications. Um, the other point about this is that we all know that uranium lasts for centuries. I mean, it's radioactive. And they haven't found a solution to deal with the waste, actually. It's a big, big issue. Um, the third issue is that Regulatory failure. Fukushima demonstrated this clearly most recently. Okay, I mean, leave Chernobyl and other things. But when nuclear power stations fail, and in, Fuk in the Fukushima context, it was very clear that regulation, etc., was compromised along the way. Okay, mega projects today in development, in my view, have a whole set of trade-offs going on and transactional dynamics that are shaping them, okay? And increasingly, to make money and to make a quick buck, many, many public interest issues are being, if you like, eviscerated and ignored. And so you saw that in the Fukushima context. The review that was done revealed that many standards were compromised. So I don't trust the nuclear energy 
energy industry because it is a very secretive industry. And it will never re re reveal in the public interest everything that's going on, how build is happening, etc. The other point about nuclear for me uh, is the financial costs. Okay, I mean the financial costs are a big issue. Um, so you know the debate we've had in South Africa: if you build eight nuclear power stations, the trillions of rands that are going to go into it will bust the fiscus. Okay. Uh, so there's, there's a cheaper technology out there that can help us deal with this situation. Linked to this, of course, is, um, and actually even the unit cost of energy. So, you know, there's, 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 a, there's an interesting debate there, okay? But linked to this, of course, is the lifespan of nuclear reactors and how far and how long they're going to go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just saying that there's a whole set of issues around nuclear that we must put into the conversation uh, and, and debate, uh, and that's where I'm coming from. For me, the balance of evidence uh, stands against nuclear, but you know, that's the debate we need to have. Uh, in terms of ESCOM, as I've been saying, so you know, those of us who say ESCOM must die, Sassel must die, uh, it's in the context in which these institutions are on a business-as-usual trajectory. None of them have tabled on our national agenda a plan for a transition. None of them. Eskom, actually, Sassol, in the Citizen newspaper the other day, and we, we are tracking it with a research group that will inform our engagements, and we want to engage their board, actually. Um, has, they have exemptions to our regulatory regime on pollution already in South Africa. But they're breaching all of that, even. In terms of their carbon emissions, I mean, Sassol is just like going through the roof. It doesn't care. So there isn't, within these boardrooms, within its executive layer or anything like that, an understanding that this is a very real issue for this country and for the world, basically. And, um, and so, you know, they have to put a transition plan on the table. And so we are saying, yes, you must die, but in the context of a transition plan that takes into account the interests of workers first and foremost, the interests of affected communities. Now, there are interesting international examples. Um, so Spain is very proactive about a transition out of coal, okay? And they are now working with communities to make that happen, and the state is playing its part, the trade unions, etc. Germany has just declared that it's 80 odd or 84 coal-fired power stations, the largest carbon emitter in Europe. It's leaving coal now. It's leaving those coal mines behind, and it's proactive about that, and it's there. We're not hearing that from the South African state. We're not hearing this from Sasso. We're not hearing this from Eskom. The South African government has locked into the Paris Climate Agreement which means that every time it goes into a UN meeting, it's going to have to report on its transition plans. Now, the biggest polluters in this country have no transition plans, okay? And this is the big issue. This is the nub of the, of the struggle, if you like, that they need to step up and bring us into their confidence as a country, as a society, about what are they willing to do so that we meet our commitments, both multilaterally but also in terms of the just transition in South Africa. In terms, of, uh, in terms of where we should go to solve this problem, I would argue that um, municipal, a municipal approach to renewable energy is key for this country. Um, it will unblock uh, the problems around Eskom. I don't think Eskom can be brought back. It's a mess. It's, it's a disaster. And everybody I talk to, whether it's trade union leaders, we had the lead negotiator of NUMSA in our meeting the other day as well, and he's interfacing with ESCOM all the time. It's a disaster. Um, and so we really have to find another pathway forward. And I would argue that the municipalization of energy, its regulation, and so on, and so on, particularly renewable energy, its incentivizing, etc., is a crucial strategic thrust around this problem. But again, it has to be managed so that the workers working in Eskom, etc. So what the trade union leaders were telling us this week in the round table was why isn't the government grappling with labor market planning so that we can reskill people that are in coal, 
in ESCOM and we can start making transitions to other industries. Where's the national, they, they were saying this to us in the, in the round table. They were, they, they were also not hostile to the idea of a basic income grant uh, when, we, when we started unpacking it in the conversation. Because I, I, I really believe that the basic income grant substantively set uh, for every citizen in this country can cushion us not just in terms of the just, deep just transition, but can cushion us from the racialized inequalities tearing this country apart. Uh, so it can, it can meet both uh, objectives at the same time. And I think it's a crucial element in this just transition. The other thing that, that we all were, were agreed on is that South Africa ha has a carbon budget. And there's no leadership around industrializing renewable energy in this country, um, a public transport system. So Denel, I mean, why can't we take the capacity in Denel and other uh, industries and build public transport systems in this country that are based on clean renewable energy. Uh, so there isn't a kind of industrial restructuring plan within our carbon budget that can help us move in the direction we need to go. So, so again, these are all the elements of a plan that could help us, if you like, leave Eskom behind and move in another direction. Um, it may not be the answer, but it's, it's one perspective. <laughs> oh, sorry, I forgot, I forgot to name it, odious debt. Yes, yeah, so there was a great ruling against the World Bank recently around corruption and so on. And so I think many, many of us are trying to pick up on that and bring it into the South African context. So the big loan that was meant to roll out renewables, actually, ended up supporting Madupi and so on. So there was a great article written by someone at AIDC in the Mail and Guardian, excellent. And I think it's, it's that kind of perspective uh, that we need to bring into the campaigning. Right, okay, so one, one more round of three or four questions that have gone to introduce yourself. A kiss from Bob, I'm with anthropology here. Yeah. Um, you referred to Germany and uh, manifesting the Netherlands also recently, the, uh, the Green parties have been very successful in pushing all the political parties into uh, being more responsible and moving away from diesel, etc. But now when we look at South Africa, we're in a completely different setting and my question is basically, how could one address the enormous gap between the wealthy and the poor and make the uh, transition that you um, advocate uh, something that is um, inviting to people who are unemployed and, mm -hmm. poor and who are attracted by modernity and by everything that the government is offering them? Um, or promising them, and how can political parties be moved? Is there, from your experience in activism, a way of making, for instance, the uh, job creation potential, income creation potential of, of uh, structural changes to make that um, more clear to people? And could one learn, for instance, from the treatment action campaign in mm -hmm. terms of their strategy of building alliances and having a broad swath of yeah. different Thank you. It's great. Hi, Megan Davies from the CST. Hi, yeah, Megan. Yes. Um, I have a question about your thoughts on the NPC's just transition roundtable process, mm. high-level process that we've been running, also trying to engage. Um, strategic thinkers, but also a grassroots movement, and, and where do you think an, an, an entity like the NPC um, should be supported also in their endeavours, and, and what, yeah, what your reflections of that process have been? Thanks. Uh, let me just start with that. Um, you don't want to take oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, my question, or rather comment, uh, so I'm Björn Harold, I'm a PhD student from Germany, um, working uh, on Reclaim the City, uh, Reclaim the City uh, my comment goes in the same direction as I just forgot the name um, of uh, um, him. Um, I think that one of the biggest challenges, apart from the political economy perspective, is a cultural change. Mm. So um, we have to like all step down um, off the high horse of consumption. Mm. We have to get dirty again. We have to get small scale again. We need to sweat outside to work. So and it's completely unsexy. Yeah. Yes. So mm. how, how do you think we can make it sexy again to get our hands dirty and um, create that cultural change that, um, uh, yeah, so 
and Great. creating a counter hegem uh, um, hegemonic ideal of um, modernity as we know it. Great. <clears throat> Big questions. <laughs> one final one? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I was just wondering in terms of political economy and race economy, if you could comment on who's producing renewable energy in the country now. Mm. So I was just yeah. in the Northern Cape and yeah. looking at those new wind farms or solar plants and trying to then figure out who has the best most break and so mm. no names on the on the board and then you find out it might be Shell, it might be Total. So it's international mm. transnational corporations and very much is there, since this is the last round, is there one final comment, question from anyone? Okay, uh, thank you uh, for the questions. Uh, so, you know, this point about um, parties and, and aspirations and so on and so on. So, none of the, the major political parties in South Africa have a serious position on the climate crisis. So we put out a critique uh, a climate justice critique of, of the main big three parties before the elections, and we read the manifestos. Um, so, you know, the, the ANC has a throwaway line in almost the last page of its manifesto about its commitments to the IPCC. Um, but in the main, it brings forward this idea of an accumulationist, carbon set centric developmental state, industrialization now. It wasn't there 26 years ago, but now some, suddenly it's refinding some orientation around uh, manufacturing when most of it is almost dead. Uh, so you have this kind of 20th century conception of industrialization coming out uh, from the ANC. Uh, the, the DA has a discourse on climate, but it's a very elitist discourse on climate uh, and climate issues. And... Um, well, it's, you know, it's, 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 it, it, it alludes to the crisis faced by farmers, particularly, and so on and so on. It's all there. Uh, but it doesn't have a conception of climate justice and what it means for a big transition and things like that. And, and, and the EFF is, well, it's very incoherent. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, they allude to a figure around uh, carbon emissions being reduced. It's a thumb suck, so I'm not sure what the science is behind it, etc. They talk about it, the green revolution. You know, they, they use this language, but the green revolution yeah. for anthropologists and sociologists who study development, we know what how disastrous the green revolution was. Uh, so uh, yeah, it doesn't add up to much, basically. So you you know you have a sense that you know because because if you read actually the EFF is resource nationalist actually, so it'll have something on climate, but in the main it's more extraction. And so on and so on. So, so it really doesn't add up to anything serious amongst the political parties. They all actually, in one way or the other, uh, are, call, are calling for the continuity of fossil fuels as part of an energy transition. So there isn't a serious climate crisis concern um, being articulated at the level of institutional politics in South Africa. Uh, you know, we called on the president last year. We had an open letter to the president as soon as the IPCC 1.5 um, degrees Celsius report came out. It was signed on by over 62 organizations from the trade unions, um, Greenpeace, etc. And we sent it to his office. And we were basically asking that a special sitting of parliament be held. Because this is the most serious uh, alarm bell being, being rung by the IPCC. And we said, please convene an emergency sitting of parliament, open up the debate on this report, and let's talk about its implications for our transition and our policies. We never received a single response, not even an acknowledgement from the state president's office. The deputy president's office, because we also sent it to his office, replied and acknowledged receipt of this memorandum of demands. Um, so th this is just underlining for me that there's a crisis of leadership in our political system around this issue. Now, when it comes to the issue of uh, alternatives, you know, so when most people talk about climate change, they talk about uh, mitigation and adaptation. And, you know, the dominant discourse coming through more and more from the U.S., et cetera, is just about adaptation, right? So it's too late. Uh, and we mustn't mitigate. And this is really the discourse of the carbon-based industry, 
right? They want to prolong the use of fossil fuels. But actually, from a climate justice perspective, um, in terms of systemic change, a lot of the ideas that have come out uh, from various movements on the planet today, we go beyond this kind of binary of you know, mitigation and adaptation. So if you look at food sovereignty, food sovereignty will do both at the same time. It'll help us mitigate and sequester carbon, while at the same time, it'll help us build adaptive uh, and a complex food system. Okay, so there's, there's, it's a powerful idea, actually. If you look at the, 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 the whole issue of climate jobs, climate jobs, uh, there's, there's a, a great, great campaign. campaign. It, it comes, comes out of um, European trade, trade unions. It found its expression in South Africa. AIDC, interesting NGO here in Cape Town, has done a lot of work on it. I was involved with them initially to map the South African economy and say, okay, each sector, what's the carbon footprint? If we transition out of these sectors, how many jobs can we create? So, for example, if we have a clean energy public transport system, uh, or if we have a national public service that is doing uh, restoration, okay? So we have uh, massive pollution sites in this country because of over 150 years of mining. And if we restore this with, with climate, natural climate solutions, etc., we could have 3 million jobs in this country immediately. That was the figure that the climate jobs campaign came up with. Uh, so I'm just giving you examples of where we can have structural change. We can have structural change in the context of building new systems um, that can sustain our society. Uh, that, that can, can work, work with science, science, that can work with technology, technology etc., uh, and, and move us in a direction that also addresses inequalities, etc. But we're also going to have to have some hard conversations, which relates to that last question. Uh, I think it was, no, no, it wasn't the last question. It was the question about consumption, culture, and sexiness, and so on. We're, we're going to have to break with productivism, basically, if we're going to survive. Because productivism and its emphasis on just having more and more, mass production for mass consumption, means that you are using up more resources on planet Earth, which means you are polluting more, okay? The entire productivist model is, is, is ecocidal. It's a threat to all forms of life on planet Earth. And so that's the rupture that we have to have in this transition. And it does mean slow living. Uh, it does mean uh, us working at a different metabolic rhythm and living at a different metabolic rhythm and so on and so on. It does mean that. Um, it's this frenzied, hyper-fast world. That's over. We, we can't take that world into the future. That's, that's some of the things that we're going to just have to leave behind. And living slower might be a good thing for us. The temporalities that come with technology are highly problematic. I mean, we're only beginning to understand the stresses and the strains and what it brings to us as human beings now as more research starts to happen. But I, I really think that, um, and Michelle and I have this debate all the time about techno time, uh, it's not the best thing, actually. So, you know, uh, sleeping, um, I'm not sleeping, going more slowly uh, and so on is going to be very, very important. Um, and I think there's some very, very uh, important issues here. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, there was an interesting uh, socialist in the 19th century who defended the right to be lazy. I think it's a very interesting conversation to be had. Uh, the issue of leisure time, the issue of reducing working time in the context of a post-productivist society. I think these are very, very important issues uh, that we're going to have to be talking about. Um, so, finally, um, Oh, so Megan, you, you, you know, your, your, your point was about the NPC. The climate justice politics I'm involved with and what we're trying to aggregate and build, which relates to the whole question of alliances, etc. We're not a lobby group. Uh, we don't want to be a lobby group. Uh, we really want to build critical mass power to shift society. That's, that's where we are. And we want to confront the state, we want to confront carbon capital, heavy and hard as we go forward now, as the stakes increase. 
Uh, so that's where we are coming from. Um, I've, I've spoken to people like Tasneem and so on along the way. They know where I stand on this and others. Um, so, you know, in the context in which you have an ANC political program, which it's campaigned on, it's really about reproducing the minerals energy complex. The NPC and other things are really going to be, if you, it, we've seen this for 26 years, the ANC has mastered the art of co-option. Listen, I was in the alliance, I was in the Communist Party, I sat in all those meetings, and, so, and I know how that machine works, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and they just co-opt, and they, they basically neutralize discourses, etc. they inflect it, etc., etc. It's dishonest, unethical politics. <laughs> and we are at a place where, we are at a place in history where we gotta speak truth. We've got to be honest about where we are. The summary, these conferences, etc. what are they giving us as a society? You know what I mean? And we've got to bring mass power to bear. If there's no mass power, sociologists in the room might understand this with historical sociology and so on. If you don't have mass power, we're not going to change it. We're not going to change this country. So yes, I mean, I think it'll be great to have an add-on to an NPC, NPC document that calls for fracking etc 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 so that's that's the last iteration of the national plan i read okay so it, it's incoherent it doesn't add up we need a break with that thinking and this is what i was talking about we need a post-productivist paradigm we need systemic alternatives uh, we need a just transition that can build a new socio-ecological order and this is the global debate uh, the, the the prime minister of new zealand woman leader very interesting I don't know if anybody's been looking in that direction. And she said, I'm leaving growth behind. Yeah? yeah? Uh, it's all about human well-being, etc. Bhutan, uh, you had Devin Pillay here, the happiness index, okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There, there's a whole shift going on on a planetary scale. And the ruling elites of this country are stuck somewhere, okay? And, 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 and they are not going to help us make the leap that we need to make. So, but I mean, I, I just think it's important um, that we appreciate uh, the differences around strategic orientation. Uh, was there anything else? Who is what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, that's a good question. Okay, maybe you can answer that question because they have a project mapping this kind of stuff. Uh, but the limited insight I have on it in terms of the competitive bidding process, etc., and who's climbed in, I mean, it's Siemens and it's, it's other kinds of corporations that have climbed in there. And I think, the, uh, you know, A African Rainbow Minerals, uh, what's his name, Patrice is in there, etc., okay? So you have a process that, um, that is reproducing a capital-based uh, system of energy again. Okay, and I think this is some of the contention in South Africa right now, you know. Uh, it is interesting in terms of the influx of capital that it's brought into the country. You know, it's being flagged by the neoliberals in the state as the, the front runner of kind of FDI and things like that. Um, but again, really, I mean, is that the way forward uh, for the country? Um, and I think this is where I stand with people like Mark Swilling and others around remunicipalizing energy. Uh, as part of this complex transition. And um, I think that's the future, socially owned renewable energy. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, but, uh,